Yeah, does this work? I guess I can do it without mic, but I'm a <clears throat> little bit ill, so if I'm uh, unintelligible, then please tell me. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is uh, Tim Laning. Uh, I'm with a company called uh, Grendel Games, and uh, we mostly uh, design uh, serious games. And uh, I was asked to show some of the work that we do uh, with our company and uh, the reasons for doing it and the method that we practice uh, to pull it off, basically. We're a um, relatively small company with 22 people on staff. Um, basically, we've existed for 20 years, and um, uh, we do a lot of different things besides designing uh, serious games. We also do a lot of um, stuff in the Netherlands to uh, build a community. There are some examples of that. In the top left corner, you can see um, our Global Game Jam uh, edition, which we've held for nearly uh, a decade in our office building, which is a 17th century <coughs> old prison uh, castle with a, with a moat. It's really cool. Basically, we put uh, students and developers in prison cells for uh, 24 hours and we develop games. In the top right corner, you see uh, something that we uh, try to do annually. It's called Next, Art, uh, Next Gen Art Event. And basically, it's um, an art exhibition between modern art and video game art uh, from across the world. Uh, usually with, much like this, a lot of uh, talks uh, and lectures by uh, game developers such as, well here you see Derek Wass, uh, the chief art director of Bioware, looking, for, uh, looking at uh, his own artwork which was printed for the first time. It's a, it's a large museum. We had uh, over 200 pieces of art from video games that were actually um, put there. In the lower left corner, you see uh, uh, me in my role for Dutch Game Garden. Dutch Game Garden is uh, an incubator uh, with uh, five different uh, offices in five different cities with over 100 uh, different companies. Uh, and we try to get backing from the government. This is our president uh, of, uh, of our country. And we try to uh, get as much cash and funding and opportunities for, uh, for local companies. And in the lower right corner, you see our festival, which is the Gameland Festival. We have an island in front of uh, our country called Ameland. It spells like Gameland minus the G. And that works uh, really well for having students there for about a week, designing serious games, usually with um, one topic. And uh, the people sponsoring it will uh, be also be the topic. So it could be Greenpeace, could be basically any NGO or, or large company or larger problem that we're facing. We have game designers and uh, developers from uh, all across the world there as well. And it's uh, really cool because we can sit on the beach with a campfire and uh, usually students then uh, get a crack to show their portfolio to people like John Carmack or whoever. Uh, usually they would have problems coming up to these people, but if they're there for a week sitting by a campfire, cracking a beer, that, uh, that really helps, uh, helps matters. So that's the other stuff that we're doing. Further, we're designing serious games. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this image, but this is basically how we apply it. To the upper left corner, you can see theory, uh, content, and game design, which we all mix up. And what we thoroughly believe in is uh, that you have to do a lot of cross-pollination to get to come to fruitful, serious games. So working together with completely different domains and different domain experts and then applying video game mechanics and video game logic, you come up with zany ideas uh, which make uh, complete sensible products in the end, which is a, a gratifying journey. We also sternly believe in uh, straying from the beaten path, so coming up with stuff that hasn't been done before, just to experiment. And that has uh, left us with uh, creating some, uh, some really uh, beautiful things. And I'm trying to address it per topic. We're a small group, so I wouldn't mind if you just raise your hand or uh, interrupt me to ask questions uh, so that, that I can expand upon it. We have all the time in the world to do so. So the first thing is uh, on rehabilitation. Well, uh, Mr. Talbot is here, so he knows uh, this particular project uh, pretty well. Uh, we started out with doing stuff for Motec Medical. Karen system, Karen system. Uh, who's familiar with the Karen system here? Uh, Thomas obviously is. But Karen is an abbreviation for computer assisted uh, rehabilitation environment, and uh, we started designing video games for 
um, basically infantry who stepped on landmines and IEDs who need to get adjusted to living life with a prosthetic limb. Um, we mostly did the simulations and games uh, for uh, people that work with lower and upper new prosthetics. And it's actually a pretty cool story. That's how we came into the space. Um, we were hired by Microsoft to do a game called Slave to the Blade. It, it never ended up on the Xbox, but this was for the original Xbox. And uh, when we were doing it, they said, well, we need you to make the game more gory. It was kind of an animated game, so we had uh, keyframed animations, and they wanted us to do motion capture. Um, so this was back in 2002. Uh, so we did motion capture. We came up with really gruesome uh, animations. Uh, it was basically a game with um, it was a combination between Mortal Kombat meets Guild Wars. So you'd have these huge hulking Vikings that would beat each other to death and uh, would uh, uh, basically chop each other's limbs off. And the thing was that uh, Microsoft ended up with not doing it because they wanted more casual games on it. Um, but the company that we did the motion capture with was Motec Entertainment. And the CEO to that company, Michiel Westermann, uh, said, well, perhaps you can help me out because we've built this application and it works wonders. It's from an academical point of view, it's the very best that we have. It's a, it's a, a system that allows us to do a couple of things, but the target audience absolutely hates what we've made. And we didn't know what it was, but uh, we said, well, okay, that, that's fine. It was a paycheck and uh, since the Microsoft gig wasn't going through, we uh, were desperate for cash. So um, I ended up going to um, to um, a rehabilitation home, which I didn't know at the time, and I came into this place. It's a beautiful place in the Netherlands. It's a large park, and they have all these small houses. And when we got to these houses, uh, it turned out that there were like 140 um, service men and women uh, that were all um, um, that were all in desperate need of rehabilitation. Most of them had lost their limbs, and uh, as it turned out, the game that they created was. Uh, essentially a rehabilitation platform, but the target audience prior to be going to Afghanistan or Iraq would have all played games on their Xboxes and Playstations. And they saw the games that they were meant to play on this thing, and uh, it just didn't gel with them. It was low in terms of production value. It was a completely different thing. It looked like a game a bit here and there, so they knew that it was uh, what they were supposed to do but it just didn't gel with them. And that's when we started applying entertainment mechanics to make it more appealing to them. So this is a, a little video of the system. <clears throat> Welcome to the Virtual Environment Laboratory in the Military Advanced Training Center. This laboratory is a unique and innovative intervention used to enhance the current rehabilitation program here at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Housed in this 20 by 20 foot space is one of the most state-of-the-art pieces of medical technology available today, the Computer Assisted Rehabilitation Environment, or Karen system for short. When the MATSI opened, there were only seven other Karen systems in the world. This is one of the first two Karen systems to incorporate an instrumented treadmill. The other is at the Center for the Intrepid at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. The system utilizes 12 motion capture cameras in combination with a six degree of freedom motion platform, meaning that the platform can move up, down, right, left, forward, and backward. The platform can also rotate 18 degrees in any direction, giving it a wide range of motion. The platform has a diameter of approximately nine feet and includes a treadmill which is embedded into the top surface. This treadmill is instrumented with four force plates to provide valuable information to the patient's physicians and therapists. To give you an example of how precise the system is, here you can watch me attempt to balance a stick. Now we'll see how the Karen system balances that same stick. As you can plainly see, no problems at all for the Karen system. The two video projectors are used to project virtual scenes onto an 8 foot tall, 120 degree curved screen. An audio surround sound system is utilized to allow for better scene immersion. 
The system also has numerous safety features which allow the operator to suspend or completely stop the system and simulation. Patients are referred to the Karen by their physicians, therapists, and or prosthetists, and together we establish rehabilitation goals. The majority of referred patients are either amputees, individuals with mild traumatic brain injuries, or both. I'm going to cut off the video there. <clears throat> So that was a re really cool system uh, to work with. We've uh, designed games for that platform for about six or seven years. Uh, and we learned a lot from that, but uh, the, one of the problems with the system is that it's extremely expensive. What we wanted to do, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, it was, it was the same hardware. Yeah, and that was part of the problem because, uh, but I'll get back to that a little later. Uh, a lot of times in this space, there's a lot of money for the hardware, or for the idea, but there's not a lot of money for in terms of production value, which was actually the reason why we did this following project called Oath of the Griffin, Griffin Rider. Uh, so we wanted to have something that's commercially viable for a larger target audience um, uh, that ha had the right production values. Um, and we created a game specifically for children with DCD and cerebral palsy. Uh, so mild traumatic brain injuries and so on and so forth. Uh, something that they could use at home to uh, rehabilitate together with their parents, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, but on consumer grade electronics. Uh, so that particular project is called Griffin Rider. And we're working on uh, a, a mobile platform. This is an early prototype. This is an old photograph. But uh, we're currently, we have a system much like the system that you saw back there. But then the difference is that it only costs 6500 which is still a lot of money. But in our country, it's being reimbursed by the health insurance company. So it's, it can be placed at small, smaller rehab centers, whereas the other particular system costs hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars. Um, and this particular game, the good thing about it is that you can do it from a distance. So it's telemedicine, uh, off of the Griffin, and a physiotherapist can basically from a distance see what uh, children are playing and can also change uh, certain aspects of levels like difficulty curves and so on and so forth. And what we wanted to do was basically create um, a fairy tale for children to play. And they're playing on the back of the Griffin. It's much like uh, Legend of Zelda meets uh, Panzer Dragoon. So it's, a, it's an on-rail game, uh, because that's obviously uh, what these children uh, need. Uh, and it needs to be slow, because otherwise they can't play it. Um, and I'd like to show you a gameplay movie. So one of the pro problems of creating games like this is that you have to be able to create an economically viable case. Uh, and uh, we've uh, really struggled for a couple of years to get that going, but uh, we're really proud that we managed to do, be able to do that. So uh, we're currently in our country, we're working together with the largest health insurance company of the country. And uh, we did a lot of academic validation together with universities to make sure that anybody can be reimbursed by the health insurance company that uses the game together with a physiotherapist or rehab experts. So uh, in, during development we work with about 300 children in seven different uh, institutions and five universities for a period for four and a half years to create the game, to work out the business case and to make sure that we basically have live ops, uh, economic uh, uh, system in place that allows us to work with parents and their children uh, and the physiotherapist and the centers to create extra content to make sure that the back end that we've built for it allows for a physiotherapist to uh, see and track all the data and commit that to uh, the, the health insurance company that will then look for better options and better fits for these children 
to, to do this. And the good thing about it is that they don't need to leave the home place, so it saves a lot of money, especially in, in large rural areas. Uh, where there's uh, not enough uh, physiotherapy centers or rehab centers uh, that can accommodate uh, these patients that live uh, uh, ways off. So, just a, a quick overview of that particular project. When we uh, noticed that we could actually uh, do behavioral change, uh, which we've done since the early 2000s, we uh, decided on uh, the next topic that we wanted to address from a similar background, also an economically viable business case. And we said there's something that we would like to do with obesity and obesity prevention. Obviously, obesity is a large problem. Um, I don't know, we just had a small discussion with the educational panel about uh, what, what makes it so hard for these games to gel with your target audience and makes it hard to sell them. Um, so we decided to uh, build something uh, that works from an entertainment perspective as well. It took me about four and a half years. I uh, got on a plane from the Netherlands, not so far from here, and I met up with uh, Jim Davis, who is the, the original cartoon artist for Garfield, the cat. And I said to Jim, I think uh, the only way we can pull this off is by working with a major entertainment IP. And I think Garfield's the perfect character to do it. It's a fat cat, doesn't like to move, uh, loves to eat lasagna. Uh, and in that way, you can do it tongue in cheek, you know, because the last thing you want to do with serious games is you, you don't want to be moralizing anything. So you have to do it tongue in cheek. So we designed a game called Garfield vs. Hot Dog. Uh, and it's a game that's out on tablets and smartphones. It will be released in the US somewhere later next year. Uh, we're currently releasing it across the globe. And this is the reason why we developed it. It was uh, an entertaining game with a message. That's the way that we're framing it. And the educational value of uh, the game lies in teaching children and their parents everything about a healthy lifestyle, particularly about obesity and how to prevent it. So the reason, the way that we built this is we, contact, we contacted uh, the World Health Organization. We got all the statistics for all the different countries in the world on uh, what message children need to have at what certain age and uh, for them to be able to make informed de uh, decisions and to influence their parents in uh, getting better food, having better um, uh, ideas about nutritional value. And uh, the WHO basically handed us uh, a list uh, of universities that helped them identify these goals and work together with international programs. So we then enlisted seven different universities to work together with for the development of the game. And uh, we built a game that uh, does that in a tongue-in-cheek manner. This is one of the trailers. Garfield's friends are in trouble. Fast food, soda, no exercise. Everyone's washed out and cranky. The hot dog company has completely taken over town. Now Garfield loves his sleep in lasagna, but this is way too much. And a dog controlling his neighborhood? No way. Explore the culinary habits of people around the globe to complete your comic collection. Play with Garfield's friends to race, cook, eat, jump, walk, shake, and kick your way to victory. Will you help Garfield bring some sense to this doggy dog world? Become our friend and join our ever-growing community. And this is what it looks like <clears throat> from a, a gameplay perspective. <laughs> So to me personally, this is a very important project. Uh, we spent a couple of million of our own money on it. Um, uh, and um, the entire budget was uh, done without subsidies or loans. So uh, we managed to get all that money from uh, from different parties focused on the target audience and the target. Yeah, sure.
Yeah. Yeah. I'll address that in a second. <clears throat> I've prepared a couple of slides that go a little bit more in depth about that, but yeah, that's, that's always been a challenge and that's one of the reasons why our company has existed for as long as it does, because uh, we had that confrontation very early on where uh, we basically risked having to close the shop if we weren't able to crack that particular puzzle. And uh, the short answer would be it takes a lot of time to investigate all the different stakeholders and then uh, you have to make them proactive. Uh, and, but I'll go back to that uh, on a second. So the game was uh, designed for a specific target audience, uh, children aged five to seven, seven to nine, and nine to 11. And there's uh, a lot of importance in why we broke down that target audience in those three subgroups, because they all have very different learning objectives. So children aged five to seven need to learn what the differences are between good food and bad food. Uh, and then you can go on and nuance stuff a little more. Uh, so then uh, we started teaching them, okay, so how often do you have to eat per day? What is it that you need to eat? Uh, what is it that you can keep away? And finally, it's a nuanced message. We're not saying you can't eat any hot dogs or hamburgers. We're saying if you do that, you have to make other choices and you don't ha have to do it. You shouldn't do it all the time because that's bad for you. Um, so we designed a game flow and architecture uh, where we have cities and that's very important to how we economically made this viable because um, we created from the outset we created different cities we created European cities we created American cities we created Chinese cities um, uh, basically cities all around the globe and added their own local food and their own nutritional values this gave us a couple of options it gave us the option to give them content that they re would recognize and that would uh, would uh, strike the right tone with them. Uh, but it would also give us the opportunity to talk to regional and local governments and health insurance companies to do stuff for branding opportunities. Uh, and we're talking corporate responsibility and uh, um, consumer loyalty, basically. What you have to keep in mind is that our system, our health insurance system, is completely different from the one in the U.S. So if we do corporate loyalty, uh, corporate responsibility, and consumer loyalty uh, uh, stuff, our companies don't have uh, an economic driver, per se. So it's much more from a marketing perspective. The game flow and architecture that we built for it is... Um, set up like this, so it's set up as a free-to-play game, so it, it does a lot of things with player retention and RPU that you would expect to find in other, at any other free-to-play game, but uh, we made sure that the content that you could acquire for it was being paid for by the stakeholders, so health insurance companies and so on and so forth, uh, which added a lot of benefits because it would still retain the free-to-play mechanic, but we didn't have to basically dry squeeze children, which was the last thing that was on our minds when you're creating something that's built to learn uh, and educate them. Um, so uh, some quick facts, so target audience was children five years and up, budget for development alone was 1.4 million USD and then there was uh, about 1.4 million in research and validation studies. Uh, development time was about a year and a half, it's ad free, free to play with uh, IAP for tablets, PC and Mac, and phone. And so we have two different ways of publishing the game. For the entertainment market, it's only being published in entertainment markets where uh, we have regions that we cannot connect to the serious game market. We publish ideally for publishers there. Uh, so there are certain places, uh, for instance, in Japan, we haven't been able to find a find, uh, response with the, uh, the local health community or the regional uh, policy makers. So we just decided to put it there through a publisher on the entertainment market, where it still does a lot of good stuff in terms of retention, but we just made the entire game uh, for, for one uh, amount of money. So the, all the free-to-play stuff, all the extra retention stuff is being baked into one, uh, one executable, basically. The serious game market is different. We publish with partners in the healthcare domain, idea that ideally together with already in place initiatives from national regional government, health insurance companies and schools. 
So basically we try to identify on a per country basis how many initiatives are there to fight obesity and what are the, these parties doing, how are they connected, could they serve as a distributor, could they potentially uh, be able to reach that target audience, could we do it through schools at, um, and could we make sure that we at least break even with, uh, with that, uh, f for that particular investment and get our return on investment elsewhere with the entertainment uh, uh, deals that we can make, which turned out really well. So to give you an instance, uh, uh, in, uh, with, together with the European Union, we've uh, talked to 23 member states in the European Union that all had uh, initiatives concerning healthcare and children. And uh, basically, uh, we gave le lectures in, uh, in these 23 member states and managed to publish it there uh, with locally branded content. So for instance, in Norway, it's available. Uh, and the city of Oslo basically uh, paid us money for the game. And they put it uh, in the App Store. Then we set it on free, free mode. So basically, everyone can download it for free. The local government is, uh, is advertising it. And in return, uh, we built the city of Oslo in the game. We put their food in there. And there's uh, local branding for their uni universal healthcare system and all the phone numbers for when you need help for education uh, and so on and so forth, which is a pretty good deal because it gave us money to create extra content, uh, which is Norwegian-based content, but that we could roll out in China just as well. Just like the Norwegian kids love to play the Chinese levels, the Chinese kids love to get their hands on the Norwegian levels because it's just part of the game's DNA. So that model has worked out really well for us. <coughs> and uh, we try to do that with basically every uh, single game that we make. Another example of this is uh, smart energy and water. Uh, so working together with the Internet of Things uh, utilities and gaming. And uh, basically we believe that we can contribute to saving the planet. Here's a list of the reasons why. This was built and designed from a, the water perspective. So water is becoming a more scarce resource in many regions. And we can teach people uh, to have, uh, that their actions have an impact on uh, our world's reserves. We can save energy used to produce water, warm water. It's basically uh, what we can save. And we can allow water companies to act toward a more sustainable society and load their brand, once again. So that's from a corporate responsibility uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and we can allow consumers to contribute to a more sustainable society. And this particular game was also designed to up social cohesion in neighborhoods. So it's a, a neighborhood water battle. Um, we can supply users with a fun and effective solution that gives insight and empowers them. And basically, we were aiming here to shave peak water level load. And we did that together with uh, Vitens, which is uh, the largest water company in our country. Uh, Census. Census is uh, the world's leading um, uh, water monitoring uh, and uh, smart system sensor for water grids and our regional government and our local government. The game has won uh, numerous awards. We've won the Census Reach uh, uh, Award worldwide, uh, the Aquatech Innovation Award, uh, special mention, and uh, the Dutch Game Awards in 2016. I'll show you uh, how it works. Basically, we designed a game that children play in schools, now they're, or at least uh, they did, we did that in the prototype, and now they're playing it actually uh, outside of school. It's a Mario kind of game, so it's a platform game, but it's directly connected to a real-time water grid. Um, so you can see uh, in the top left corner, you can see that children are playing the game. That's an uh, image depicted on the lower left corner. In the game, there's uh, education, and there's a connection to the direct water grid. You have parents and uh, residents in neighborhoods that uh, use an app to predict their water usage. And um, the water is actually measured in real time. So instead of parents banging on the shower door of their teenage daughters complaining that they've been under the shower for 16 minutes, we actually reverse it. You actually have children banging on their parents' shower doors like, Dad, you have to cut out showering because the water level in my level isn't dropping. They cannot physically, in their virtual world, they can physically not find certain buttons or open certain parts of the level because the water level in the neighborhood is actually too high. So we have a direct real-time uh, uh, competition. Here you can see that work in, an, in a movie. The top left corner, or, or in the left, you can see children play the game. They collect trivia. Trivia is being sent out to the app to people in the neighborhood. 
They can ask, uh, they can answer some trivia about water. It educates the neighborhood. And if they answer it correctly, those points go to the kids at the school that are competing with each other in a, in a large battle. In the right corner, you see people uh, making an estimate on the amount of water that they're going to use. And the moment that they're using it, they're planning that usage, that's being reported back to the company. And 24 hours later, they can see how well they've done. And that directly influences the game that the children are playing. So if they planned it correctly, they get a load of points. Plus, they save a lot of money. The money that they save is being rewarded back to them by the water company. In part, that's being invested in their no neighborhood, and in part, that's a, a, a reduction on their actual uh, water costs. So they're saving money. Uh, so some of the results we can share. So quantitatively, overall peak shaving results. So normally, it will be 1% uh, uh, water consumption, 1% in the evening, and we managed to have a, a get an output uh, in the morning of two to three percent in the morning and in the evening. Um, and this is peak level shaving. And just to tell you what that is like, uh, peak level shaving is not really important in the Netherlands. Basically, my country exists of mud. We have mud everywhere. And we have big pipes and water runs through it. And if everybody starts using water at the same time and we need bigger pipes, we just dig up the old pipes out of the mud and we put in bigger pipes. It's not a lot of money that we're spending, so that's not all that important. The one moment that all water companies dread is when the Dutch soccer team actually manages to go to the World Cup and everybody goes to the bathroom at the same time. That's basically when the water companies are praying to God that the system will hold. Uh, but that particular example works better in, uh, for instance, the city of London. So that's one of my clients, Thames Water Utility. Uh, the city of London is uh, uh, arguably a Victorian city. It's an old city and it has a very old creaky, leaky pipe system that they basically can't access anymore because the metro, the subway, is right on top of it. And on top of that, you have the entire economical financial IT grid of Europe. Uh, and it's, so it's very hard to break open, but they lose, because of peak level load on the network, they lose 25 million liters of water per day. That's a lot. Um, I'm just probably lost in translation between the liters and the gallons thing, um, but 25 million sounds like a lot, right? So quantitatively results, average normalized water usage before the water battle, and then you can see what actually the game did, and you can see that you're, you're actually sh sh shaving those peaks. And um, well, let's just, so there's a, 25, there's a more than 25% reduction of water usage during morning peak by best players, and all players significantly reduce water usage during the event. We built an entire show around it that was on daily television on the ch children's television channel. Um, and uh, in the top left corner, you can see the winners. The, there was a winning neighborhood, and they totally changed their showering and washing routines. They, even uh, months after the game finishing, they were still doing that. So there was a durable behavioral change. Now, if you map this to electricity, it becomes far more interesting since water is so inexpensive, and only warm water costs money. But now we can arguably do it with energy as well. So we're working together with a couple of big energy companies in Europe to basically uh, do the same thing there. And uh, basically what they feel like, it's a real fun way to do something sustainable with the whole family. And there are a lot of different lessons learned. Both pi pilots have had a relatively short duration, three months each, and both pilots were played in a local setting and communi communication to end users was very difficult uh, because it was so technically complex and uh, so innovative. There were basically no other projects like this when we started it. Uh, so it was very hard for us to, uh, to, uh, to pull it off. And now that we've uh, basically um, done it like uh, three or four times, we've managed to also put it up for electricity and fine tune it. Uh, I don't know if you have this in the US. You probably do. This is an electricity smart meter. And my argument for it is the thing doesn't work. We've installed it in our homes in the Netherlands. Uh, so the government has been sending them out. The electricity companies have been sending them out in the hopes of people changing their behavior, but it's not happening. And one of the reasons before it is because the, although it gives you data that you can analyze, it doesn't give you any information on how, how that usage came to pass. And um, 
basically I view this particular device as a platform such as a uh, Netflix or Xbox Live Arcade or the um, Apple uh, uh, App Store or the Google Play Store. If you put content on this for specific target audiences to work together and play games with the electricity grid and with the water grid that can actually make the money, and I'm talking a lot of money, that they can save, then uh, there are a lot of reasons why you would play games like that. So the current pilot that we're doing is in two villages in uh, our country, Heteren and Zetten, they're called. And they've set up their own electricity company. And the problem that we have in the Netherlands is we have a lot of rural areas, and the rural areas um, have been lo losing a lot of money economically because everything's draining away to the cities, which gives them less government funding, which means that a lot of things just basically go away, like uh, community houses, uh, um, activities for children, and so on and so forth, playgrounds. Basically, uh, there's, there isn't any money for it. But what we found out is that working together with our game and a, a solar panel project, over the course of 10 to 15 years, that those two villages will spend 82 million euros. So that's roughly $100 million, uh, $93 million. Um, and by utilizing the game system, if we keep these percentages up, they'll be saving 17 million dollars, uh, euros. So that's uh, 23 million uh, dollars. Those two communities will save that they are then free to spend on their own environment. And we were talking about intrinsical and extrinsical motivation during the, the, the educational track. I say this is a pretty good extrinsical motivator. If you, with your own society, your own small part of society, you can basically pick up the tab and become uh, independent of the larger water companies and lar uh, or the larger electricity companies and save yourself a whole bunch of money by inspiring people to do the same, then uh, that's a pretty good argument. So another game that I want to talk about is about surgical training. Um, so this is laparoscopy or keyhole surgery. Um, as you can see, it's uh, quite different from open surgery. Open surgery would, uh, this is what you see here is a cholecystectomy or the removal of a gallbladder. Uh, they used to do it with open surgery, which leave you with a large gash on your stomach, basically. And then the surgeon can practically see what he's doing. You will remove the gallbladder, have this big cut, and uh, it, it will take you months to rehabilitate. And uh, this is laparoscopy or keyhole surgery. It works differently, so they blow up your uh, abdominal section with uh, CO2 gas, which gives them room for maneuverability. They insert three small tools. Uh, the tool in the middle that you can see is a scope, and the, schools on the, outs uh, the tools on the outside are basically instruments that uh, the surgeon will use to cut out and retract the, uh, the gallbladder in this particular situation. But you can also see that uh, the surgeon is watching a television screen. Plus, he's holding controllers in his hands. It's a quite big, it's similar to, to video games. Um, here you can see an image. Is that, does anyone have problems with bloody images? This is your chance to turn away. OK. So this is the removal of a gallbladder. In the lower right corner, you can see the surgeon actually pulling off the work. Uh, and the large screen shows what the surgeon is uh, uh, doing. And what you can see is one of the largest problems uh, in laparoscopy is that the scope also houses, besides the scope, it houses the, the light source, which means that the light source is always shining directly at the thing that you're operating on, which means that the shadows are cast directly behind it, which means you don't have any depth perception which becomes a problem when you have to put these large tools into an abdominal section. What you don't want to do is uh, incidentally hit a liver uh, while you're working on a, a gallbladder. So this is something that you need to train. Plus you can see that the surgeon is working with his both hands, so he needs bimanual dexterity. Cholestectomy takes, what, 35 minutes, something roughly. Uh, you probably know if you're right-handed, uh, and you have to write with your left hand, and you have to keep that up for 35 minutes, it's a pretty daunting task, so it's something that needs to be trained. Plus, you have uh, inverse movement. Uh, if this would be an abdominal section, a tool would go in. Left becomes right, right becomes left, up becomes down, down becomes up. And you have what we call the fulcrum effect. If the tool's not inserted 
very deeply, you don't have a lot of freedom of movement. When it becomes deeper, you have a lot of freedom of movement. This is something that you need to train as well. All these things are normally trained on a simulator. This is one, it's a lab mentor. It's a very beautiful machine. It works very well. Uh, it teaches, teaches you all the basic skills in laparoscopy. It teach you, teaches you medical procedures. It's an extremely expensive piece of kit. I don't know what these goes for now, but uh, 150K, I guess, it would be. Yeah. It's a box. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, and, uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, with randomized controlled trials that show uh, the effects of uh, of training on a simulator like it. it uh, you become uh, really become a better surgeon with this in mind. Henk de Kate Hoedemaker, who's a Dutch director of a skills lab, uh, decided to spend a couple of million on this skills lab, and he decided that a lot of people would come and show up. As you can see, the place is practically empty, and the reasons for that was because most of the time the stuff was not available, residents didn't have time, and it was out of order uh, most of the times. Uh, but the real reason was that people were just really bored with it. So the simulators look very, uh, look very interesting to a layman, but once you've actually worked on tissue, on, for instance, a pig, pig station, they'll never go back to the virtual model because the virtual model does just doesn't feel right. There's always something off. And uh, they really wanted uh, uh, something that would keep players engaged. And so we designed a game called Underground. Underground doesn't look like laparoscopy training at all. Um, it's basically a game that has a very mad father who lives on an alien mining planet, needs to take care of his daughter. Uh, but he needs to run a mining operation. He has all these mining droids that need to do the mining operation. Kid needs to do her homework. Uh, so he decides to give her one of the mining droids, which becomes her butler. The mining droid is called uh, Swank. And Swank and Sari, the little girl, basically have one hobby other than doing their homework, and that's dancing the tango. So they're dancing the tango all the time. She's not doing her homework. Dad's really mad about it. Sends the robot back down to the mine shaft and the little girl's upset with that, so she goes down to the mine shaft to save her little friend, ends up in trouble, and you play the role of the friend in a large mining vehicle that needs to save the little girl. In terms of gameplay, it's much like Pikmin, uh, the incredible machine in Lemmings. It doesn't remotely resemble laparoscopy, but it was published on the Nintendo Wii U, so that's a consumer-grade electronic, which gave us a lot of benefits because uh, this is a piece of kit that you can buy for $150. It doesn't break down, simulators do. It doesn't come with any expensive uh, uh, agreements to do repairs, because you can just go to Toys R Us when it breaks down and have your warranty. We can distribute it worldwide through the Nintendo uh, network, free the Wii U eShop, so there's no overhead whatsoever. Um, and it makes it uh, economically viable to give this to residents at home where they're playing games anyway. They're playing games during their lunch breaks, they're playing games on their iPads, they're playing games at night on their Xboxes and Playstations, so why not give them a Nintendo uh, with a game that's actually training their basic skills? We designed a specific controller for it. We uh, basically worked together with Nintendo of Japan and uh, we utilized the Nintendo Wii U, that you, uh, the Nintendo Wii Remote that you will recognize from bowling in your living room. Um, and the nunchuck controller that came with uh, uh, the Nintendo Wii and Wii U. We used that for an analog grip. And basically we designed a game that did everything that you utilize in the FLS test, the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery, but we made an actual game of it. This is a screenshot. So you utilize two tools. We built puzzles or um, problems that you need to solve. All the levels have the same size as an abdominal section. You see that we use a lot of different colors. And you can see that we use lighting, but there's no shadows to be found anywhere. So we're doing the depth perception training thing. Um, and there's no reason to not do it in an underground mining world. That's perfectly fine. I mean, surgeons train with putting matches back in boxes. Uh, 
uh, and there's no difference between this and that, besides the fact that this actually keeps players entertained. Uh, so we've built uh, this game for four years. It was published uh, two years ago. Then it was stacked up to the regular FLS test and uh, with good results. So th these are some, some of the results um, where you can see that the total score on uh, the laparoscopy in seconds to the left and the total score on the FLS back transfer test in seconds to the right. Green is... Um, Red is ex novices, green is experts. As you can see, there's one outlier. This, that was uh, someone who did, uh, uh, was a general practitioner. Kind of missed his calling, should have become a surgeon. But, uh, um, so this was our first initial test and then we basically threw it out in the world. And a lot of different randomized control trials were done uh, with it. It was featured in national, uh, uh, American, uh, national Endoscopy and American Journal for Surgery and in Lancet and uh, a couple of universities that looked at it ranged from Stanford to uh, all loads of different uh, universities, uh, 11 of them in total. And uh, basically what they found out is that this game, which cost 19 bucks, does the same as a simulator that cost 250,000 bucks. Uh, so that was, uh, and arguably it's now the best sold laparoscopy training uh, kit in the, in, in the world. And this is what I like best about it. This is the trailer for a laparoscopy training simulation. Peggy 7. argue that that is the only um, sales video for laparoscopy that has robots in there that are that actually are there for fun. Uh, this uh, this project uh, got its own life. It was featured uh, on BBC. Uh, BBC did a documentary about it with BBC Horizon. A couple of months ago we had a visit from this guy, Bill Nye. Uh, it's out on Netflix. I don't know if you have Netflix, but uh, Bill Nye Saves the World, uh, episode 7. Uh, he visits uh, my company and it's particularly about this game and about a math training game that I'm doing for children that have uh, severe learning disabilities, also together with Garfield. And uh, one of the most important uh, me things I find is this. This to me epitomizes it all. Basically, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. And there's an anecdote to this. So I'm very happy with the fact that we have all these great uh, scientific and academic validations of our product and I know that that, that is important but what I like best was uh, the moment that was on one, of the, one of the skills labs in Strasbourg I don't know does any has anyone does anyone know the skills center in Strasbourg perhaps you this is one of the largest uh, it is currently owned I think by Medtronic Ovidian it's one of the largest uh, skills labs uh, that there is uh, in, uh, in, in Europe and there was this uh, surgeon, Lucien Retroy, which is a, a very, very important surgeon. He invented a lot of laparoscopic procedures, and he's a... Uh, is this being filmed? Yeah. Okay, and I'm not saying it. He's a, a bit of a, an awkward guy. Um, and uh, this bit of an awkward guy, uh, he was very remote towards the game. So there were a lot of young kids that... Uh, uh, he was a typical surgeon. He was uh, the epitome of typical surgery, surgeonness, yes, that he was. Uh, and he was standing back, he was hanging back, and a lot of kids were playing the game. Kids, I'm, I'm talking residents, uh, 20, 25 years old. And uh, he was standing there with a couple of well-respected surgeons. I'm gonna say it anyway, he was an asshole. Um, but um, he was standing there with a couple of very well-respected surgeons, and uh, they were having fun of the game, you know, they said like, what are you doing with your game? Uh, and I got frustrated because I was there for that particular audience and I, I, I came up to him and I said, hey, man, you know, 
we're here doing our best. If you have a problem with this product, product, why don't you at least try it? Try to form your own opinion instead of just hanging back and talking to a lot of people without even having played it and just dis discarding it. Yeah, he said, yeah, but I don't play video games. And that's, that was the, the key moment that I had him because I said, but you do surgery, right? You're a good surgeon, right? He said, yeah, I'm one of the best surgeons in the world. I invented this procedure, I invented that procedure. I teach at and blah, 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 blah. Said, well, if you're good at surgery, you're supposed to be good at this game. You're supposed to be able to compete with these kids even if you haven't played video games at all because we use a laparoscopic tool. So why don't you just play the game? And this guy, he played the game and he did it in one. He had the highest high score of the whole bunch. And that was the moment when he actually turned around to his friends and said, hey, you should play this game. You know? And, and that to me was true validation because uh, it actually acts like a surgical tool. But the reason why it works is because it's an actual game. It's entertaining and it's fun. And it could do all the other stuff. But that wouldn't make it as successful as it is now. And I guess that's my conclusion, which leaves me with 10 minutes for questions as asked for. And if not, I bid you all a fond farewell. Any questions? Yeah. So how do we get the collaboration with um, industry? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, for, first, for, first things first. Uh, you have to identify st stakeholders. And you have to identify what return on investment people are looking for. So let's just leave them aside for a bit and let's just look at your typical investor. So what's the ROI rate that they're looking for? And are you able to come up with a business case that will make them back that money? Odds are that you will find those investors and you will find that business case, but you won't find it in the direction that you're normally looking at. Same thing with the Garfield game. I mean, I had to go to investors and ask them to basically shell out a couple of hundred thousand for a project that was all about nutrition education. Uh, they're not exactly lining up uh, to, to, to invest in that. But once I had a business case with all these different countries and I, and I identified all these uh, uh, regional policy programs that actually have money in the bank to educate children in terms of health care. And I just looked at it at a, as a global problem and I looked at what I needed to do in terms of localization, language, but also food, also culture, uh, and uh, do that translation bit. Uh, what stood we to gain from that besides achieving our objectives in terms of education? we had to look at the commercial uh, objectives as well. And I think that f with uh, educational companies, uh, it works in a similar way too. So for instance, the, um, the math training, calculus training game that I'm building for children with severe learning disabilities, the, the game itself will be free or it will cost a buck. But the back end will actually cost a little bit more and the back end will be sold to schools and it helps the, the schools because it identifies problems with children with learning disabilities really quick and it saves them a lot of time. And that's the business case that we focused on. So how much time is this going to save uh, teachers at any given time during a year? And how many students are there on a national level? And what institutions are there that I can talk to that can eventually help me distribute that particular project? And uh, can I find something, for instance, an ent ent entertainment IP that will be willing to help you uh, that you can combine with, such as I did with Garfield for this particular thing. Uh, thing. Um, and th that helps really well as well because Garfield is a strong brand uh, that children love. Uh, so it's in the top five list still of uh, most recognized brands, especially by parents. It's very much trusted by parents. Uh, and parents are the one doing the purchasing, so that was a very important uh, identifier for getting the Garfield license and working together with uh, Jim Davis and this really cool group. Um, 
but that also helped us get an edge because because we had the Garfield license, we stand out within the educational realm because there's so many educational calculus training projects that don't have a face attached to it or it's designed and built for by academics and they come up with their own IP like I did with my Griffin Rider game and my underground game. But that's going to cost you more money because it needs to become visible. So visibility is a very important issue as well. So working together with an entertainment license is very important. And if you set something up that has like a dual return on investment uh, model, for instance, so the Garfield versus Hot Dog game, if you don't know that it is a game about nutritional value, it's just a turf war game between food trucks. That's what it is. And because that's because that's what it does really well, I can sell it to entertainment game publishers as well in those countries where I cannot reach uh, the right parties uh, to work together with. So it's all about carefully examining all the different stakeholders for all the different facets of their game that you're designing and uh, then slow, slow, slowly building your plan but making sure that you get that return on investment. Because I'm an entrepreneur as well. I need to make back my money. Uh, I'm not doing it for a non-profit. I, mean, I love doing things for, uh, for the planet and for mankind. I mean, that's the reason why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. But I also want to be able to uh, take care of uh, my own, so to speak. And um, uh, I, f I think that's the, the, um, the best advice that I can give anyone. And don't give up. I mean, building serious games, or Spectre said something about games being hard, designing games can be hard. And uh, you, those boundaries will make you creative. The box, being in the box, I think that's true to a large extent. But I would also argue that building serious games, the way that I just described it, is like the Olympics of designing video games. It's way harder. You have way more boundaries. You have financial restrictions. You have um, academic restrictions. You have economic is, uh, restrictions. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough world. Uh, out there, but it's a lot of fun to do, and it's uh, gratefully gratifying, I would say. Thank you. Thank you.